Aloha, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, I wanna get started a little early because we wanna make sure we give our guest um, a little more time for his presentation. My name is Joe Kent. If uh, you're unfamiliar with us, I work at the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, which is a free market think tank in Hawaii. And on behalf of Kelii Akina, the president and CEO of our institute, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. He had to be at a conference on the mainland today, so I'm filling in. But uh, today is a good one. We're talking about housing and the housing shortage and looking across the world at what has actually worked. Um, I'm gonna read a piece from the Wall Street Journal here in 2019. It says, in Japan, home prices stay flat. Um, why no affordable housing crisis in Japan? A big factor, experts say, is the country's relatively deregulated housing policies. Um, and so we're gonna learn more about those with the Tokyo model from our special guest, Tobias Peter. Tobias is a research fellow and assistant director of the American Enterprise Institute's Housing Center where he focuses on housing risk and mortgage markets. Um, he's originally from Germany and he came to the US 20 years ago and became a fan of the free market while he was at school in Minnesota. Um, Mr. Peter has testified before Congress. His pieces have been published in policy journals and in the popular press, including the Wall Street Journal, American Banker, and Business Insider. Um, he has his master's degree in public policy from Harvard Kennedy School and his bachelor's degree in history and applied economics from the, Saint, from the College of St. Scholastica. Now, before we begin, I just want to say that there is politics around housing, and we all know that, and especially this room uh, is filled with heavy hitters that really know the, the housing issue very, very well, um, and know that there's political realities to that. Um, we asked Tobias to present the technical solutions that have been found across the world. So they may not match our political <laughs> realities, but, but we want to learn what, our, what has been done, what has worked, in Tokyo and other places, and from there we can try to see what might work here. So um, with that, let's figure out what happened in Tokyo. Thanks, uh, let, join me in welcoming Tobias Peter. There you go. There you go, and here's your, there you go. All right. Well, thank you, Joe. And thank you to the Grassroot Institute for um, having me here today. Um, this is actually my first time in Hawaii and must say you have a set of beautiful islands over here. I, the Grassroot Institute wants to invite me again next year. Please, please feel free. <laughs> I'm not gonna, not gonna be opposed to that. Um, so as Joe said, um, we, I'm from the American Enterprise Institute and um, just to give you a little bit of background about us, um, we've been, we were founded in 1938 as the American Enterprise, um, American Economic Association, and this was done in response to the New Deal, with the government getting involved in many businesses and also taking over many of the, many of businesses. And 80 years later, we're still at it. We're still fighting a good fight. Obviously, we have not won every single battle, um, but we're trying to move the needle as we, as we move along. Our big ideas are freedom, enterprise, opportunity, and our, we like to say at the housing center, our middle name is Enterprise, American Enterprise Institute. And um, we like to come up with market-based solutions to, to the housing problem. Um, we have really three firewalls, as we call them. Um, we don't take any money from the government. We don't do paid research. And as a scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, I have academic freedom, which also protects me from getting fired for saying something stupid, like hopefully I won't, I won't do today. So obviously I don't need to tell you Hawaii is one of the worst housing, um, housing markets in the country and even internationally. Um, out of the 50 states, Hawaii has the highest median home price, the second highest median rent, um, very high rates of home, uh, homelessness, and also as of recently, a lot of out-migration because a lot of people are getting priced at the housing market and uh, particularly many natives who have been around um, um, for a longer time. But then we also started looking, as Joe said, we started looking internationally. And there's a study from 2018 from Demographia um, that looked at, that ranked um, um, the major metropolitan areas across the, the US, but then also internationally. And um, 
you can see we've, I've ranked them in order from least affordable to more affordable. And um, at the top, Hong Kong, Sydney, Vancouver stand out. Um, the worst affordability in terms of affordability in the US is San Jose, California, um, where the, the, the median price to median income ratio is 10 times. So you need to earn 10 times your income to buy the median home. Um, and, but then Honolulu at 86 at 9.2% is uh, 9.2 times is not much behind. So you, if you are, you need to multiply the median income by nine to get the median home price. But then if you work your way down the, down the list, you find that Singapore at 61 and, and 60 Tokyo at 4.8 um, and, and both at 4.8 are relatively affordable for these larger metros. And um, in Hawaii, I'm sure you've already heard a lot about the Singapore model. And, um, but there's another model, the Tokyo model, which is much more free market based, which is what I'm gonna be, gonna be diving into. So what is the Tokyo model? The Tokyo model I sum up in just one sentence. It's a market and property rights based system with little possibility for local interference. What do I mean by that? The key difference to the US are really that the zoning rules are very strong. Uh, the, the the, 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 in Japan's constitution, the property rights are very strong. That goes back to General MacArthur after the war who inserted um, that the right to own or hold property is inviolable. So that, that, that's in the Constitution. In the US, another key difference to, to Tokyo, in the US, um, zoning classifications are also exclusionary, meaning if you have a zone um, that is zoned for commercial, you can only build commercial in that zone. Or if you have a zone that is single family residential, you can only build single family residential. In Tokyo, on the other hand, zoning is inclusionary, meaning that um, each zone has a maximum use category and everything below it is also allowed. So if you have a zone that's um, zoned for commercial, you also need to allow residential in that zone. That um, also creates a lot of mixed use, walkable neighborhoods. Um, but um, also in Japan, in Tokyo particularly, you only have 12 zoning categories. Um, so the lowest allows for far higher density than the single family detached zones in the US. And also the, the, the lowest zoning category only accounts for about 20% of all the land use versus in the US, single family detached residential accounts for far more. And all zoning is also done by right, meaning you have the right to build uh, whatever you like on your property. Rather than the US, you have to go through burdensome regulations and hearings to get something, something approved. And finally, the local jurisdictions in Japan have little discretion in setting their own zoning rules or hindering development. Um, and I'm gonna go into this in a little bit. But the reason why it works is that it's a functioning free market in the housing front in Japan. And it allows for natural development within the loose confines of these zoning rules and um, it puts really, it puts the market at the forefront rather than urban planners. And the beauty of this system is that if um, prices, if home prices, land prices get expensive, you have an automatic trigger where the free market steps in and is able to convert the homes to a higher and better use. And I'm gonna show you an example of that in a second. And then finally, the other reason why it works is, um, it enables, the, the process enables filtering because a lot of the new homes that get built in Tokyo are priced at the middle of the price range. And that's very important because now if someone um, buys such a home, they free up a home l lower down the, st down the stream, which a lower income person can now move into. And this filtering process is very well alive in Tokyo, rather here in the US where it's broken. And hence, as a consequence, um, the Japanese model and the Tokyo model <laughs> Um, leads to lots of new construction. It, um, um, it leads to far greater affordability and it leads to mixed use walkable neighborhoods and also um, obsolete units get replaced um, relatively quickly. But here's one, the concept of highest and best use. Um, what do I mean by that? Here's one example from Vienna, um, Virginia, which is a suburb of DC. I mean, you could literally pick any other high priced area for this, but you have two homes side by side and hope everyone can, can read this. On the left, um, you have a home that was built in 1952. Um, it was built on an acre, on a half acre lot, so large lot. And the home is um, three bedrooms, two bathrooms, 1500 square feet. And today it's estimated at about $800,000. 
So that home was built in 1952. And I guarantee you that the home on the right, before it was torn down, looked exactly like the home on the left. But because home prices started to increase, land became more expensive, what we found in what happened in, in, on the neighboring lot is that the home was eventually torn down and it was replaced in 2004 with what I would call a McMansion. And by McMansion, I mean it has five bedrooms, one and a half bath, it's 4,300 square feet large, and it is now valued at about um, 1.7 million. Mm -hmm. However, the lot size, half an acre, that's a huge lot. At that size, you could easily build for example, four homes that are each sized at about 1,500 square feet living area, and they would probably be selling at around $900,000 each. So now if you do the math, you would end up with a total value on that, on that lot of $3.6 million, which is twice as much property value, and also property, taxable property value, um, than what you end up with the McMansion. The problem is that zoning and land use regulations restrict the highest and best use of the land, and hence you end up with a suboptimal outcome in the market where you end up with McMansions rather than relatively affordable, uh, four, four, four units that are relatively affordable. In Japan, on the other hand, you don't have this outcome. You would end up with the four units that would get built, each valued at about 900,000, 1,500 square feet. And um, ironically, in this country, we ha would have had the same outcome had we not introduced zoning as pushed um, by the federal government in 1921. And the goal behind this was in 1921 was that um, there was a racial component behind the zoning drive, namely to make housing expensive in order to price out undesirable groups out of, na out of certain neighborhoods. And the undesirable people were, of course, black people, but then also Eastern European immigrants that um, people wanted to, to price out. And the Supreme Court said at the time, you cannot do it overtly, you cannot do, any, you cannot do it overtly racial, but the, the workaround, and the su Supreme Court eventually blessed, blessed it in the Euclid case, was you can do it through zoning by making, um, by restricting the highest and best use and by making um, the land more expensive, and hence housing more expensive, and hence pricing out certain people with lower um, incomes. Here, this is something um, what we found out very recently, and which is a, um, a relationship about density or lot sizes, home size and home price. And this goes back to the McMansion case that I, that I showed you earlier. If you have large lot sizes, meaning low density, you're going to end up with large homes, the McMansion case. However, if you have lower density, meaning you artificially restrict the lot sizes, you're actually going to get this almost near linear relationship where um, Tobias, could you explain this graph a bit? What, oh yeah, sure. Uh, what is the bottom and the left so, side? Yeah, so on the, on the x-axis I have the units per acre, so this is the density. So if you have, on the left side, if you have, um, if you have lower density, like three units per acre, um, you're going to end up, and this is for Honolulu um, County, you're going to end up with a lot, uh, with a home that is about 2,800 square feet large, and it's going to cost you about a million eight. If you, through some zoning quirk, were to allow for a little bit higher density, so at, for example, at the middle of the, of the range here at seven or eight units per acre, um, you end up with a home that is 2,000 square feet large and costs you about 1.3 million. And you have this near, almost near linear relationship um, where you um, can increase affordability just by lowering the lot sizes. And this relationship that we found here holds virtually in every county across the US. Um, it also holds on, um, on Maui. This is um, Maui County here, um, where on the far left, where you have density at about two units per acre, um, you're gonna be building homes that are 2,800 square feet large and they're going to cost, in this case, going to cost almost $2 million. But if you allow a slightly higher density at about five, six units an acre, which is roughly the median of the homes that have been built since 2000, um, you're going to end up um, with homes about 1,600 square feet that are now selling for a million two. So in terms of affordability, if you could just encourage um, to be building in the middle of this range, you would be getting a lot more affordability because the houses would be smaller and they would be costing less. At the same time here in Maui, 
Um, there were about, since 2000, there were 6,300 homes that were, be, be, that were built since over that time period. So this is, this is data, this is real data, this is not, not a model, this is actually just looking at what has been built over the last 20 years. And um, you built, th there were 6,300 new homes that were built. And the median density is about five units per acre. Have you, had you increased the density by 50%, let's say, and gone to from five units per acre to um, seven and a half or eight units per acre, you would have gotten, instead of 6,300 new homes, you would have gotten over 9,000 um, new homes being built. So 3,000 additional homes just by lowering the lot sizes a little bit and using the land a little bit more efficiently. And as a consequence now, because you have um, more density, as a city or as a county, you can also tax more, which um, you know, kind of is, is very um, useful information to, to city planners, um, but also to, to elected officials, um, because it's an easy way of increasing the tax revenue at very low cost. But the homes that would have been built would have been much, much, much cheaper than the ones that are um, at low density. So why is it so important that you build in the middle of the price range? And the reason for that is really because if you're building at the middle of the price range, you get a functioning market. And in housing, the market is really broken. And we broke it because of zoning, uh, zoning laws and um, other regulations. This is best explained by looking at the car market. You have new cars and used cars. And think about the time period before, think about the time period before the pandemic when everyone wanted to buy a car and car prices just exploded. But think about it from the perspective, the car market before the pandemic. And there you had a market where new cars were being produced at the middle of the price range, so about $25,000, $30,000 you could buy a new car, right? And, um, but you could also buy a really nice car for you know, a, a ton of money, like a Ferrari for 100,000 even more um, dollars. Of course, at the high end, you weren't producing as much, but at the middle of the price range, the 20,000 to 30, a lot of new cars were being produced. Um, at the same time, um, because you're being new cars were being produced at the middle of the price range, a lot of these cars that had been driven for two, three, four years, they were then sold off to someone else because that person could buy a newer car, and hence this, this older car filtered down eventually all the way to the bottom so that everyone who wants a car can have a serviceable car in this country. And at the same time, no one really complains as of an old car that has been on the, mar on the road for 20 years, right, if that gets taken off the market because it's, it's, it's being, it's being um, demolished. Imagine what would happen to the car market if we were to put in restrictions and let's say the government comes up with a restriction that we say, well, because we really want people to accelerate quickly, any new home that we're going to build needs to, be, um, needs, to have, needs to get from zero to 60 in, let's say, under five seconds, right? So now you could no longer build the cars at $25,000, $30,000. Now you could only build virtually Ferraris, right, or very high-priced cars. And over time, as you're only adding a few new cars at the top end, only very few people could afford to buy these Ferraris. Um, but um, it would also take now the, the, the used cars that are in existence, they would all increase in price because now demand keeps growing, but there's not much new supply that comes on. So the price of existing cars would increase. And at the same time, no one would get rid of an older car um, because you would just kind of try to bat, uh, patch it up, try to fix it up just to, so it remains roughly serviceable, but those older cars would be coming very obsolete and you just, you know, you kind of make sure that they're on the road because they're still so valuable because there's just no new supply coming on. If you think about the housing market, this is exactly what has happened where we've restricted that you can only build these very new, very expensive homes now. And um, as a consequence, we have a broken market where the filtering process does no longer work. Likewise, with the car market, no one would come up with and say, in order to sell a Ferrari, you also need to sell a Ferrari at a lower income person, let's say at 30 or 50 percent of area median income, just in order to sell that one Ferrari. That's just, it, just, it just doesn't happen because the market works where an older car gets filtered down. In the housing market, we have come up with all these crazy ideas that um, like inclusionary zoning or rent control that really have broken the market and they have not addressed the root cause, but they have only exac exacerbated the problem. And, um, and yeah, so hence in the housing sphere, we end up with very high, high cost burden. We end up with these um, 
obsolete houses still being on the on the on the market um, they're getting fixed up a little bit but at the same time because we're not building more we are creating this big gap between um, the haves and the haves not and um, we're getting suboptimal outcomes and um, that's 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 the issue that we're currently facing Tokyo on the other hand does not have these issues and the reason why is Japanese zoning and here this looks at the 12 zoning categories in Japan um, all but one of them, the, the industrial only, where you, in all of these zones you can build residential. And the first category, category one, um, that's where you can build um, what I would call um, light touch density. So you can build single family homes, but you can also allow, um, it also allows for, for slightly higher density, namely um, you can build um, a couple, two, two, three stores, stories high. And um, yeah, so this one here, this one is the, the lowest category. And, um, yeah, so you, here you, you see um, you can have a slightly, slightly lower, larger homes um, and um, they're also allowing small stores to be built, small offices, and hence you get this, this mixed use. Um, but at the same time, if for example, you wanted to allow commercial, which is, uh, where's the commercial category here, if you wanted to allow commercial, that means that all of these categories above it, they would also be allowed to be built in these areas. So if a city anticipates at some point in the future, we're going to be, you know, we're going to be expanding in one particular area, um, then um, as of today, it may just be economical to build these lower density um, homes, but over time, as um, the land becomes more valuable and more development moves out in the direction, um, then you then you upzone, uh, then the then the, the the homes all get get torn down and replaced with higher density. And then another factor is um, why the market in Japan works is because of the Japanese building restrictions, and the local jurisdictions have very little um, control over them. Um, these twelve categories here are set from the federal government. But as you can see, um, there's also a maximum floor area ratio. So how much, um, how much, um, um, how much building can you fit on a, on a, on a lot? And um, there's some discretion that these local jurisdictions have, but you can see it at the, minim the minimum is 50% all the way up to a maximum of 200%. And 50 is actually fairly, fairly dense. And as I will show you in a second, in, in, most, of, um, in most of Hawaii, it is about, we're currently at a density of about 25% or even lower. So um, here, so, this is uh, really- Tobias, just a question too. Mm -hmm. um, do there, um, is there a lot of hearings and approvals that are needed? No, this is all done by right. So this is all done by right. So once it's on the book, you have, you have the right to build. And um, yeah, and the, the, the local, local jurisdictions are very much removed from the process because they only have, they can only set these, um, these loose, these loose ma maximum floor areas or here the, the building um, coverage ratio. That, that's what they can set. But the minimum is set at fairly high standards here. It's at 50%. If you go into the mid-rise category, you're at 100%. And also there are no parking requirements by... Um, What's that mean? Where do they park this? So, I mean, you need to buy a parking spot and then um, you need to actually prove that your car fits in that parking spot. So the police actually, I mean, this is Japan, this is Japanese, this is Japanese culture. It's much more differential to authority, but then the police shows up and measures that your car actually fits in that parking spot. Um, <laughs> yep. Yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously everything follows the rules, but as long as it follows the rules and fits in those categories, you can, you can build it. It's, that's done by right. Yeah. Um, and uh, Tobias, we had one more question here. Oh, yeah. sorry. There you go. Yeah, sorry. Did not see. Okay, on the different categories, mm -hmm. uh, is that set by a different, like a community plan? Yeah, so, so this, the city has the discretion to come up with these, um, with these 12 categories, wherever they want to, wherever they want to set them. Okay. So it's already preordained that these are where these particular categories are going to fit. And do they have particular type of structures that can fit into those categories? Yep, yep, that's what I'm going to show you next. Okay. Um, there's some, I have a couple of pictures here. Um, but I mean, yeah, some, some of these categories are um, low-rise residential, so there you can build up to two stories, two and a half stories. Um, here in the residentials, uh, mid, the mid-high-rise, I'm going to show you some examples where you can build three, four, five stories high. Um, can I go back to the mm -hmm, park? Sure. So given that, and given that you have to, to, to buy a car, you have to have already have a pre and say, so how are the developers incorporating those lots? Or are they not incorporporating the lots necessarily? 
Is it only in like multiple mixed use where they put the lots? Um, you mean new lots or? Uh, well, new parking areas. Oh, new parking, parking areas. areas. I mean, they yeah. I mean, they let them. They let the market figure it out. So, if you're a developer, you either can put a bar parking garage on the, you know, on the first floor, or you have a little bit of garage on the side, or you know, you don't. You say, well, well we don't, we don't have any parking. You guys figure it out, and then you know, obviously, that would be reflected in the price of the of the unit because if you need to find a parking somewhere, it makes your your home a lot less less desirable. So, and then there's no street parking allowed. Um, I mean, I, I, I mean, you'll see in Japan, they have some, in Tokyo particularly, they have very narrow streets. So, um, but um, there's, I mean, the market has figured out a way where there's parking for everyone that needs one. Um, and then lastly here, there's the building height restrictions. So the building height um, for the lowest, for the lowest category, um, there's a, the building height is set at a maximum of 35 feet. Um, but for everything else, there's no strict height requirement. And the way it works is, um, they're based on the based on the size of the street. Um, um, they're calculating and kind of these. Do you see here the formulas, the way it works? But based on the size of the street, they they're telling you how high you can build because they want to they want to ensure that there's some sunlight coming into these streets. And um, but apart from that, you as a city or you know as a NIMBY, you have no 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 control over over the, the height restriction. Yeah. How are these restrictions enforced? So um, I mean through the permitting process, I would I would assume, um, and also um, this is this is all these these these. These zones are all set at the at the federal level, so all of this is, is set at the at the Japanese national government. So I'm not I'm not in favor of U.S. government, the federal government stepping in and putting in the same restrictions as a one size fits all solution for every state. But for example, the Hawaiian state legislature could come up with something something along these lines. And we found now in California with Senate Bill Nine and Ten, which is allowing for light touch density, where they are now putting in place these um, these these overrides where um, the state law actually trumps the local the local the local jurisdictions and of course the local jurisdictions are trying to fight back and they have this little whack-a-mole going back where the local jurisdiction one local jurisdiction declares themselves a mountain lion sanctuary and then the the, the state the state legislature is like no, 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 not so fast you cannot you know you need to allow actually some development here um, but here this is from the low rise this is the, an example from Tokyo for the lowest the lowest zone zone one and um, this is, you can see, this is generally two to three story buildings. Um, you know, kind of, it's a little bit, it's a little bit hard to read, but um, Joe, you know, feel free to share my, share, share my slides after. Um, but you can see it's generally, you know, kind of one, two um, stories, maybe three. And then if you zoom in a little bit here, this is just a more or less a random street. But you can see here, this is um, the first floor, second floor, and then you have a little bit of a, um, a you know, kind of a little bit of a, um, a attic. And, but here you can also see there's a, there's a parking spot here and each house has a little parking spot and you know kind of it's a little bit hard to see but there's also a little bit of little bit of green space in front a little bit of lawn and then you know here you also have trees so and um, this is about a thousand yep lot size is about 1,000 square feet for for this particular home wow. so it's a it's a it's it's fairly dense um, and if you were to it's in the lowest, it's in the lowest. And if you were to scale it up, you know, kind of if you, you would get about 40, 40 units per, per acre, which is, you know, it is, it is Tokyo, it's fairly dense. And you'll see what the benefits of that are, but you'll see, and I show you this in, 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 in Hawaii, where you are, it's much, much, much lower density. So there might be a way of expanding on that. Yes? Um, I'm wondering, how is the infrastructure, water, mm -hmm. sewer requirements, um, who takes care of that? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great question. So, because as a city you now have also more taxpayers and more taxable property values, it actually becomes for you it becomes very easy to finance. And of course, yes, you need to you know the sewers need to be adjusted a little bit. You need to make the the pipes a little bigger, the hookups a little bit larger. But generally, that's that's very easy to do. And we actually have some case studies that we've did in the United States here in this country, where um, we looked at Palisades Park, New Jersey. It's a it's across the bridge from the from from Manhattan, and um, they yeah. That's where I'm born. Oh, excellent! Well, you, maybe 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 you should tell us about this. Actually, my my boss actually was born there too. Maybe do you know Ed Pinto by chance? <laughs> you you kind of look like the same age a little bit. 
Um, yeah, so Palisades Park, um, because of its zoning quirk, going back to the 1930s, they always allowed duplexes to be built on, on lots that are um, zoned for single family. Versus if you go across the street in Leonia, there you could only build single family homes. And what we found was that for most of the time, 30, you know, kind of up until the 80s, 90s, both towns looked about similar in terms of density, but then housing boom um, and home prices went up through the roof during the 1990s, the 2000s, it became feasible, economically feasible, to tear down these older one-unit homes and replace them with a duplexes, with a duplex. And that's exactly what happened in, in Palisades Park, the highest and best use, the free market responding to the price signal. In Leonia, everything stayed the same. But now the kicker is um, Palisades Park, because it's so much more dense, has so many more people, it has a lot more tax revenue. And as a consequence, if you trace the tax rates between Palisades Park and Leonia, in the early 2000s, they were about the same rate. Today, Palisades Park is much, much, much lower than Leonia's. And they found a way to pay for all the this additional sewer hookups um, and still manage to lower tax rates. So if you, you know, a way of selling this is, you know, look, as a, as a property owner, this may actually reduce your, over time, reduce your, your, your property tax bills. Um, so then here, this is another example from, from Tokyo. This is now the residential zone. So this is zone a category four or five. This is the, where it gets a little bit more dense. Um, and here you see about generally three to four story buildings um, with some larger ones, obviously here, for example, this looks a little bit larger, this one looks larger. But also you see this one here, which is a single family detached home on a 10,000 square feet lot. And as a property owner, if you don't want to sell your home or if you don't want to convert it to a high end better use, you have the right. You can just, you know, you don't have to change anything. You can just stick with your little oasis in the middle of, you know, kind of the, the rest, which is higher density. So this is the, I, I, to me, this looks like the market, the free market working at its best where, um, and property rights um, working at its best. Um, uh, this person is taxed at the higher category. Are the categories taxed at different rates? Um, I, I would have to look that up. I would have to look that up. But um, yeah, I, 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 that, yeah I, I would have to. <laughs> I have to. Yeah, yeah, I have to. I mean, yeah. I mean, I would assume that the tax rate would apply to everyone, but I'm not an expert on Japanese property tax law. Um, and then here, this is a, if you just kind of zoom in a little bit more, this is here um, where you have four to six story buildings. Um, you know, here you have a four, six, um, but again, here you see, you know, there are parking spaces that just kind of get, get, get um, incorporated into the, into the, the, the infrastructure there. Oops. So Tokyo's housing stock, because now you have, you can build and the market can respond, we actually see a supply response. And Tokyo certainly has grown quite tremendously. Its population has increased from 10 million in 1963, 40% up, on, up to 14 million now in 2021. And at the same time, the housing stock has actually increased by more than 5 million housing units over, over the same time period. And you can see here from this, from this chart, it's um, 1963, you had about 2.5 million homes. Um, all the way forward, um, you know, now at the 7 point, uh, the 7 point, 7 point 6 million. And you can see this is a, a gradual move up, um, very, you know, kind of 800, 900,000 units per, per year um, at a very steady pace of about 1.5% per year um, that, that has been added, which is coincidentally twice as fast as what happened in, in some of the other metro, larger metropolitan areas like Paris, or London, or New York. And um, what has, how has the, the housing stock changed in Tokyo? Um, here, this, is, this looks like at the dwelling type and height um, from 1983 to 2018. And the first here, the detached, the tenements, these are the single family detached homes. You can see, you know, they have been more or less flat at about a million five because it's just not economical to build these homes. At the same time, the one to two story apartments, you know, they have been flat, slightly decreasing. Again, the higher and better use is really to build three to five or even six plus um, um, unit buildings. And, and that's and where also, Tokyo um, has expanded. And just for the pricing too, I'm, from this Wall Street Journal article, um, the average rent for a two bedroom unit in Tokyo was slightly below $1,000 a month for a two bedroom unit, yeah. right? 
For, right? And it's, it's been that way for the past decade. Exactly, because, because Tokyo has been, um, the housing stock has been keeping up with the population growth. It has been able to um, keep home prices in check. And this is perfect segment, <laughs> segue, Joe. Um, this is looking at the, the home prices and the population growth. And you can see in Tokyo, um, out of compared to London and San Francisco, Tokyo has actually grown in population size more than these other two metros. But the home prices have been, you know, kept in check versus the other ones have exploded. And you know, that, that, that's another, not, a, not a very strong argument for, for, for new home, no housing construction. At the same time, this is looking at the rental stock and the, and the rental prices. And as Joe said, um, you, can get, um, you can get a very um, um, a nice, a nice apartment at a, at a fairly, fairly um, competitive um, rate um, because the housing stock, uh, the rental stock has been expanding um, over the years and um, the rents has actually been, been falling slightly over the time period. And then another point about the outcomes here, this is just again more or less a random um, street corner in Tokyo, um, where you have, to have here on the left you have a grocery store, um, uh, here you have a barber, um, here you have a small office building, and here you have, uh, what is it, uh, you have a butcher. And obviously, you know, a lot of, lot of residential here. And, um, you know, kind of to your point about cars and parking and traffic, um, if you, you know, if you just have to go down um, that, you don't necessarily need a car to, to, to pick up your groceries, um, which um, is another point that I'm going to get to later. Um, if you can kind of increase the density, at least in these areas where you have um, a heavy commercial activity, mm -hmm. that would help, um, um, help with some of the, the concerns about congestion and traffic. Um, and then finally, um, before we leave Tokyo, another point about, uh, about this is the obsolescence. And the median home in Tokyo, uh, the median age of, ho of homes in Tokyo is, um, it was built, they were built between 1991 and 2000. It's a little bit hard to, to tease out more because that's just, just how it's reported by the census. But if you look in Hawaii, um, the median age um, was um, 1978. And in Maui, um, it is um, 1984. So you have a, a, an older housing stock um, here um, versus in Tokyo, the old, the old, the older homes get get taken off the market um, and replaced with something newer. It's the same with the cars, right? I mean, you would want to have more cars that have the top safety standards on the road rather than having some of these old clunkers um, that have been chugging along for 20, 30 years um, that are barely serviceable um, and that have low energy efficiency. So that that's another another advantage of the Tokyo model. Okay, so leaving, leaving Tokyo and now looking at Hawaii. And obviously, I don't need to tell you, Hawaii has very high, high home prices, I alluded to earlier. So what, what happened? Why did, the, why, why did the market break down? And I think the market broke down for two reasons. Number one, in the 1960s, the zoning regime took hold, and that was all kind of, you know, um, that was all put in place by the federal government in the 1920s and the 30s. It takes some time until it really, the effects really show up. But then also in the 1970s, you had the environmental impact laws that started getting, getting, um, getting put on the books. And here, if you look at Oahu, um, this is the average, um, the annual number of private residential units authorized by building permits. You can see um, Oahu was doing pretty well up until the, the, the mid-1970s, and it fell off a cliff. Um, the same for, you know, kind of for the other islands. Um, you yeah, see also a response there, but particularly in Oahu, you have a very big, big drop, and um, it never, never recovered. Um, so that, that's certainly a, a big issue. Um, there was also a recent um, study by the University of Hawaii Economic Research Organization that um, replicated the Wharton Land Use Index. That's an index um, um, for large parts of the country um, done by academics at the Wharton, at the Wharton School of Business. Um, where they um, survey um, local um, zoning officials and just ask them how difficult it is to build and then they aggregate the results and create an index. Um, in their index, Hawaii was not part of it, um, but um, the, the University of Hawaii replicated it, the same survey for, for the islands here. And what they found was that Maui by far was off the charts in terms of building of Wharton land use regulations, by far highest land use regulations. And then the other islands were also high, not as high as Maui, but, but still fairly, fairly high. Um, so the, what, are the, what are exactly are the problems with the building code? And here, this is, this is looking at Maui's building code. And um, one particular reason is you have these 
these districts, the R1, R2, R3. And here, the min they require minimum lot areas. So 6,000 6, um, um, is, the, is the minimum lot size that you need to have. 6,000 is about five, it's about six, six units per acre. So that's, you know, it's not that, it's not that dense. Um, also, while on paper, it is allowable to increase and build, for example, an ADU, an accessory dwelling unit, or a second unit on your, on your lot if you have, if you want to. But if you want to build it, you actually need a lot of 12,000 units. So um, that kind of defeats the whole purpose because in this R1 zone, you really don't have any lots that are 12,000 square feet large. So in effect, um, it's, it's very much limiting what you can build. And then also if you look at the, the setbacks, they are fairly stringent. The maximum height, um, 30 square feet in Japan, it's a little bit higher. But that's all, all these regulations being put in place um, that really hinder what the free market can provide. And um, yeah, and then also with the accessory dwelling units, in the R1 zone, for example, you can build one, but you can only build up to a maximum size of 800 square feet. And 800 square feet is not that, not, not that large. So that kind of, you know, kind of that limits what, what, you can, what you can build and how, how desirable that, that ADU is. And um, then you add in parking requirements, it just becomes um, very burdensome and un not feasible. Here, this is the same, same um, slide, but for Oahu. And um, here, again, the same story, you have all these, these zones and Oahu actually allows it 3,500 square feet. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's better than Maui, but it's still, um, it's still not, not, that, not that dense. And um, same thing with the two families, all of a sudden it doubles. Um, if um, here, um, if you look at the maximum building area, I mean, the, the, where's the maximum, uh, where's the floor area ratio? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the floor area ratio, if you look at just what, what's been built on there, it's about 25, 30% versus in, in Japan, Tokyo, the lowest is, is 50%. So um, that just, again, caps what you can build. And then lastly, um, just looking at the zoning for Maui. Um, here you have a map of the zoning um, for Maui, and I've, I've highlighted on this map four categories. Um, the one is the R3. This is the, this is the really, um, the way you can actually, the, the lot sizes are, are where you, the lot size requirements are very large. And you can see just looking visually in the map, that's really the largest area. Then you have R2, the uh, purple one, it's also very large. Um, and then R1, these are kind of these areas up here, but they are, these, these are more dense where you need 6,000 square feet. Um, but these are just kind of small areas and hence you don't get a much, a lot of density. But <laughs> the thing that really jumps out of this, on this map is, well, if you look around the, the red area, and that's all agricultural land. And um, that's really the, the vast majority of, 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 of Maui here about, um, about the, the city. Kalui is, um, it's all agriculture. And, um, you know, you tell me if this is really the highest and best use of the country. I mean, to me, um, it would make more sense to take at least a little bit of that, 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 that red area, not everything obviously, but if you were just to take a little bit, you could build a lot of new housing and um, that would make ultimately um, a dent in the housing affordability. Yeah, so this is looking at housing density in Hawaii and this is uh, in comparing it to California. And you can see that Hawaii has two sides, uh, so both sides of the extreme. On the one end, it is, has a lot of housing that's really dense. So 40 plus units, those are typically your skyscrapers, the high rises. And that accounts for 12% of the total. In, in California, it's only 4%. But then also on the other end, you have a lot of, of housing that is not dense at all. We have less than three units per acre. So those are lot sizes of 14, 15,000 square feet. And that accounts for a third in Hawaii of the, of the land versus in, uh, just a quarter in California. But then what also stands out if you compare yourself to California, um, California has much more here in this two to, uh, in this, in this um, three to nine range. Um, but then California also has much more in this 23 to, four, in this um, nine to 23 area, which is what I would call this light touch density where you allow for duplexes, triplexes, quadruplexes on, on home, on lots that are currently zoned for single family detached. And you could add a lot of new housing um, if you were to allow just a little bit more density here. And also that would also lower lot sizes, smaller homes, lower home prices. And also if you look at the density, the population density for Honolulu, 
is at you know, 5,600 people per square mile. That's not that far off from where Houston is. It's nowhere near where Tokyo is, right, at 16,000. But um, really, if you, you know, the land is so much valu more valuable here than what is in Houston. So, um, you know, kind of, I think the reference point should really be a Los Angeles or a Seattle that have found ways to increase the density um, while still maintaining some of their, their look and feel of the, 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 the area. So um, the housing solutions for, for Tokyo, uh, for, 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 for Hawaii, of course, this is all modeled around what Tokyo has been doing. On the one hand, as I said, if you make more, a little bit more land avail available for new, for new developments, um, that would go a long way. Um, the second thing is conversion of older homes. You could convert some of these older homes that's sitting on quite large lots to duplexes, triplexes. That would be another one. And then finally, um, if you allow more higher density of about maybe 40, uh, 23 to 40 units on these, um, in these walkable oriented developments and these areas around commercial centers, that would also go a long way. Um, and yeah, this, this would be all market driven, market based, property rights based. Um, it would be, you know, it should be done through the Hawaii state legislature. It should be done by right. It would get repeal some of those burdensome zoning regulations and land use restrictions. And um, ultimately, for example, here's an example on the Greenfield development. So this is on, the, on, on Oahu. This was built um, in 2012, um, but you can see these five homes. They are 8,000 square feet each, so that's roughly an acre. And there's a lot, of, a lot of green space, which is obviously very, very nice. But if you were to increase, and the floor area ratio is 23% compared to the 50% in, 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 in Japan. But if you were just to go down to 5,000 square feet lots, you could actually fit an additional three units on, those same, on that same area here, which you, know, you have to start somewhere. Okay, um, and then we'll, this will have to be kind of the last slide, if you don't yeah, mind. Yeah, okay, so um, yeah, here's some, just some examples about what else you can do. Um, so parking. Can you go back to that other one with the parking underneath? Oh yeah, so here, you know, just kind of here you have parking on the side, which takes up a lot of space, but oops. But here you could do, for example, if you just allow, if you go a little bit higher in density, you could have the parking fit underneath, and this is an example from Palisades Park. I knew it. Yeah, look, looks familiar, right? <laughs> Um, so, and yeah, with that, I'll just open it up to, um, I, have, I have all, num if you're interested in exact numbers, how many additional units you could add over a decade through the, through the market, I have that all sized here, but I'm going to open up for it. Let's give a round of applause for Tobias Peter. Thank you.